I want to thank uh, Dean Gustafson for setting this program up. I think the topic for today is uh, certainly uh, one of the most consequential topics uh, of my lifetime. Uh, I think uh, the crisis, and there's really uh, no other world word for it, the tragic crisis uh, taking place in Eastern Europe and Ukraine right now is something that merits uh, all of our attention. And I'm really grateful that we've got some people on our faculty who have some real insights to offer. Uh, Wallace Daniel, of course, is a distinguished professor of history and his field is Russian history. He's one of the most respected um, people in that field in the world. He spent a lot of time in Russia and I think he can bring some insights uh, that will really help us understand the background of what we're seeing in the Ukraine today. Uh, Chris Grant uh, is on a Fulbright to Ukraine. He's obviously been evacuated out at this time. Um, uh, he's in Warsaw today, where I guess it's about midnight. Thanks for staying up, Chris, to, uh, to join us. But he's in regular communication with friends and colleagues in Ukraine. And uh, so he'll obviously have some insights for us. And, uh, and of course, Jim Hunt, who's a professor of law and business here, has also completed a Fulbright in Ukraine. So I think, uh, I think it ought to be a great uh, program, some real insights from these folks. Uh, I know they've each got uh, some prepared remarks. And I don't want to cut them short, but I want to make sure we have time for questions as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anita. Thanks. Thank you, President Underwood, and uh, welcome all of you. We're really happy you are here for this uh, very serious discussion about perspectives on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, I'm Anita Gustafson, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and what I'm going to do is just set up what the day, is, uh, what the afternoon is going to look like. Each speaker will take about 15 minutes, and then we will have questions and answers. So think about uh, think about that, and students, we really want to hear from you, especially. I'd like to spend a little bit of time introducing each speaker. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the first speaker will be Dr. Wallace Daniel, Distinguished University Professor of History at Mercer. He's going to give us the historical background, and his, um, his talk is called Russia and Ukraine, The Big Picture. Dr. Daniel is a leading scholar of Russian history, and most recently, he has examined contemporary Russian history and civil society, intelligentsia, and the Russian Orthodox Church and its particular struggles to regain its cultural heritage and identity. He is widely published on these topics, and his most recent book about women in the catacombs was published last year. Dr. Daniel previously served as provost at Mercer, and prior to that as professor of history and dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Baylor. Dr. Daniel will be followed by Chris Grant, professor of political science in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and um, as you all just heard, Dr. Grant was awarded a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship to Ukraine actually last year, uh, but he had to delay it because of COVID. Uh, so that meant that he ended up uh, traveling to Ukraine in early January, uh, but then by the end of January, the U.S. State Department evacuated him um, first to come home for a little bit and then go to Poland. So that's where he is today. Um, so the, um, as part of the Fulbright, Dr. Grant was teaching at Kiev Mohyla Academy and researching the emergence of civil society in the Ukraine as a former Soviet Republic. Uh, so now this is probably gonna have to be rethought in some ways and maybe reframed. Um, his, he previously completed a Fulbright at Moldova, Moldova and has led multiple Mercer on mission trips and study abroad trips to countries on Russia's western border, places that used to be part of the former Soviet Union. Dr. Grant will be coming to us this evening from Poland and he's going to look at a very personal look at the Ukraine war. The third speaker is Dr. James Hunt, professor of law and business in the Stetson Hatcher School of Business and our School of Law. He has also served as Associate Dean for Macon Graduate Programs in the School of Business. His expertise is in the areas of business law, legal history, and business history. 
During the 2005-06 academic year, he received a Fulbright Award to Ukraine to teach at that same academy that uh, Dr. Grant was supposed to teach at this semester. His research and teaching there focused on historical and business perspectives about the rule of law in national development. Dr. Hunt will speak on the economic and business consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He is on leave for Mercer this year to teach at the U.S. Air Force Academy, where he is serving as a distinguished visiting professor in the Department of Law. So he's coming to us from Colorado Springs. Thank goodness for new technology today. After these speakers, we are going to open it up for your questions and your involvement and for discussion, which I think is going to be one of the most important parts of this evening. So thank you so much. Dr. Daniel. Good evening. Let me uh, begin with just a few very basic facts. Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe. It's a country of 44 million people, so it's larger in terms of people than is Poland. It is the first in Europe in uranium ore and second in Europe in titanium ore. It has the second largest iron ore reserves, re reserves in the world. It is the first in Europe in terms of arable land, and it has the capacity to feed 600 million people. It is also a industrial power. Uh, it has uh, very large iron and steel uh, foundries. And for those reasons alone, it is important. This issue is important, but there's going to be a lot much more that will define its importance for, for us here. So let me begin with last week and set this in context a little bit. Last Monday on February the 21st, President Vladimir Putin addressed the Russian people and in that address, long, rambling, almost incoherent talk, he made two very basic points. First one in this rambling address went back to the year 1612 when he said Russia was invaded and almost capitulated and almost destroyed. And then he carried it up through history through the timelines of history, where he said, we have suffered repeated invasions, particularly from the West, but occasionally from the East, and we've had to throw them out over and over again. And he said a number of these were led by the United States and its European allies. He also said, in reference to Ukraine, that we are now seeing this again. Ukraine is being held hostage he told the Russian people, Ukraine is being held hostage by the United States and its European friends, and we've got to, quote, liberate them. The second point that he made, and this is by far the most important, he said that Ukraine historically belongs to Russia. It shares an identity with Russia, it shares common resources with Russia. It shares a heritage with Russia. And so, in essence, that statement justified, in his mind, what he was about to announce later that week. So let's, let's take a look at that claim, that uh, claim that he made, and let's try to give some context of what we witnessed in it, perhaps a larger context than uh, than may appear on the surface. It may be said that Russia, Russia's story began in the 10th century. In the 10th century, the Kievan prince ruled over an enormous territory that stretched northward uh, almost to the Baltic Sea. 
This immense territory controlled, ruled over, controls a little bit strong, but ruled over by this Kievan prince was the seat of what we now call Russia. It was there in the year 988 that the Kiev prince, Kievan prince, accepted Christianity. Christianity coming from Byzantium, the eastern course uh, center of the, of the Roman Empire. And that will have an enormous effect on this story eventually. In the 12th and 13th century, Kiev, the Kievan principality, declined. Uh, I won't go into the reasons, there are several, but it declined and it declined precipitously. And then over the next few centuries, with Kiev left behind, Moscow became the center of this culture. And Moscow expanded, expanded eastward across Siberia, southward uh, to the plain area, northward to almost the Baltic Sea eventually. And in the 17th century, to leap upward a bit, in the 17th century, Moscow signed a treaty with Ukraine. That treaty is controversial. Moscow said, or the official word from Moscow, and this is used by Russian historians to this day, is that Ukraine had a choice, or what we call Ukraine had a choice, between Poland and Russia. And fearing Poland-Lithuania, which was a major power, Ukraine chose to be incorporated into Russia. Now, uh, I must say that uh, Ukrainian historians dispute that a bit. In fact, they say that they were coerced into signing with Russia this treaty, and they said that it was a temporary treaty. It should be only seven years, seven and a half years, and then another decision we made. Russia, of course, decided that that would be permanent. And so Ukraine, Ukraina, means frontier in Russian. Ukraine was on the frontier between Poland and the South. Then, Russia would rule over Ukraine for the next 250 years. But that reign, or that rule, was very difficult and often unruly. Ukrainians were independent. They were freedom-loving people. Uh, that is not to say that Russians are not, but I say the matter is one of degree. You can see it in their literature. You can see it in their music. You can see it in the famous Cossack dancers and in Cossacks in general who, were, who come, of course, out of Ukraine and the, the frontier area. Two of the greatest rebellions in Russian history began in Ukraine. And then, to leap to 1930, when Stalin initiated his collectivization drive, his horrendous collectivization of agriculture drive, Ukrainian peasants chose, rather than turn their cattle and their crops over to the Soviet state, they burned their crops and they slaughtered their livestock. That is going to lead to one of the greatest famines of the 20th century, that action, and Stalin was determined to bring it to its heels. Now, let's quickly fast forward to the year 1991 twilight of the Soviet Union. In August, Ukraine decided, as said, announced, that it would no longer adhere to Soviet laws. Six months later, it announced its independence. With an overwhelming 92% of the population supporting that move. This next decade, the entire 1990s would be a time of transition in, in Ukraine. It proclaimed its independence, but it also at the same time remained politically close to Russia, and it accepted a president who was loyal to Russia, to the Russian government. But this did not last long, and in a very interesting story, which details I, I, will, I will skip at least for now, in a very interesting story in February 2014, now remember that date, February of 2014, 
there was a popular uprising in Kiev in a place called Maidan, Maidan um, protest square, parade square, right in the middle of Kiev. That was in February of 2014. 20,000 people camped out on that, uh, on that square. And that began a protest that's going to last for some time. This popular revolution is known as the Revolution of Dignity, or the Maidan Revolution of Dignity, as it is. It was eventually expanded to 800,000 people. And as you can imagine, the security police cracked down and killed some 800, uh, I'm sorry, 100 people in that uprising. If, if you were to go there right afterwards, you would see yellow and blue ribbons dotting that square where each of these people had died. And if you were to go there today on this square, one would see portraits of the 100 people posted around the square with short biographies on these posters. Anyway, it just led to a huge protest that lasted all over the country. And eventually, the president, the Russian-backed president, his name was Viktor Yanukovych, eventually, he was not driven out of office, but he fled during the night. He fled to Lvov. We hear that, that place in the news every day practically now. He fled there under the cover of darkness and eventually fled into Russia. The biggest thing about that, what I've just said, is what one of the protesters said afterwards. He said, biggest thing, the most crucial thing, is that we define the direction we wanted to take. The simple fact is that we did not want to be part of a satellite state. Now, in the national election that followed, and it will come later that same year of 2014, person elected president was a Jew. He was from the eastern Ukraine. He was a remarkable young man, 44 years old now. That would have made him, see that's eight years ago, he would have been 30, 36. Remarkable young man named Volodymyr Zelensky, a former comedian whose comedy acts repeatedly poked fun at the authorities. He was famous for a short film that he did in which he portrayed a small town downtrodden school teacher who made war on corruption. And that, that school teacher, that film of the school teacher was filmed by a student of his and posted on the internet. It went viral around the world, it went viral. Anyway, he, this unknown, was elected president of Ukraine. Somebody who would do, make war on corruption, they thought, and would lead this country in a new direction. Now let me make one other quick point here on, on the background. When Ukraine declared independence, large parts of the Ukrainian church also declared independence from the Moscow Patriarchate. And I have to say that not all the parishes did this, but 7,000 did out of 19,000 parishes declared their independence. This split in 2019 was endorsed by the ecumenical patriarch in Istanbul and declared to be an official split. Now, I will tell you that Vladimir Putin and the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church hated that. So, given that background, that framework, why did Russian President Putin decide to send his army into Ukraine last Thursday, Thursday of last week? I'm going to offer three reasons. All of them are somewhat controversial. But let me say 
first of all, that I am in no way justifying Putin here because I am a critic of his. They are simply intended to offer an explanation. So what are these three reasons? First, his ultimate goal is to create, I should say, return Russia to great power status. He has certain delusions of personal grandeur. In pursuit of his goal, Ukraine is essential to this, absolutely essential. He cannot afford to have an independent, freedom, free Ukraine on his border, a neutral government that he cannot manipulate as it is. He, in looking at his view, and he's long said this, almost back from the beginning, he's long said that what he wants to create is a Eurasian Union composed of Russian-speaking people in which he, Russia, would lead. That would counterbalance what he sees as an Asian Union led by China and an Atlantic Union led by the United States. And that would be the future, in, in, as, at least as he has tried to define it. He has to have a pliable, Ukraine in order for that to happen, or he has to destroy Ukraine for that to happen. All right, the second reason. In 2014, when he lost Ukraine to this Maidan uprising, he seized the Crimean Peninsula, as you know, in 2014, and he backed two separatist provinces, um, Donetsk and Lukhan in South eastern Ukraine. By late 2021, as a prominent political scientist, Russian political science has, um, has argued, has pointed out, that had failed. His efforts had essentially failed. A friendly, pliable Ukraine is not going to succeed. The whole country was moving in a different direction. By late 2021, he understood that. His attempts at diplomacy also failed. And when that fails, in his mind, what do you do? Turned to the cannon and the gun, the naked use of force. And he is now taking a gamble that a military campaign will succeed when nothing else will, and that will promote the goal he is seeking. And then third, having a democratic society, an emerging democratic society on his border, one allied with Western democracies on his Southwestern border is deeply threatening to any authoritarian government. So let me conclude this introduction with several, several comments. The stakes here are huge. They are huge for him and they are huge for the world. I'm going to have to revise my understanding of Vladimir Putin and revise all the lectures I've ever given to my classes on Vladimir Putin. You probably should send them all a letter and say, what I told you about Putin, I think, is misguided. I never considered him a riverboat gambler, but one who prizes stability, one who prizes order. That is obviously not the case. He's taking an enormous risk. If he succeeds, if he wins, if he weathers this storm, it will be at great cost to people there and elsewhere in both Russia and Ukraine. But it will move him much closer to that, uh, that goal that I, I defined at the beginning. If he loses, if the Russian people fail to back him, it will eventually lead to his end and the end of his regime. 
Personally, I hope this ladder will prevail. But the stakes could not be higher. It is the conflict between an authoritarian and a democratic society and an authoritarian world and a democratic world. The, the three blocks that I, I defined earlier, China, Russia, the United States, two of those three are authoritarian. We see the same conflict here in the United States between those two forces. The Russian-Ukrainian conflict brings this right to our doorstep. And let me mention one other thing. What Putin has done is something that is a throwback, not to the Soviet period, but before that, to the old 18th and 19th centuries. Well, what does that mean? It means that not only has he initiated the largest, largest army attack since World War II, not only has he done that, but what he has done is saying that a rule-based system is no longer viable. What he's done is to destroy the old rule-based system that was created following World War II to prevent war and to prevent force from happening again. That rule-based system has been violated, perhaps destroyed, by this assault because all the treaties and all the wars and all the establishments that were created after World War II had been violated and may no longer be applicable. We can talk more about that. Okay. So I believe it's my turn to speak, is that my understanding? So I could not agree more with what Professor Daniel gave you as an outline. The goals of Putin, I think, are very clear. Um, I think that he's really helped us to understand some of the Russian framework when Putin speaks, that he's speaking to audiences that will grasp um, an understanding of the world where Ukraine is little Russia, which is what it was called back in the Russian Empire. Um, you had white Russia, little Russia, and Russia. And we used to send ambassadors to the three Russias. And um, that was the idea of what Russia was. And for many people who live in Russia, that's still an identity that they identify with. And so Putin uses this to hearken to that. He also uses some rhetoric, which is um, very familiar to Soviet um, scholars. I just want to say, when we're talking about Soviet Union, behind me, you'll see a picture that I took tonight of the Palace of Culture and Science, a gift from Stalin to the people of Poland um, in 1952. Stalin gave many gifts to the people of Poland, um, including tyrannical rule and a secret police force that locked people up and killed many. And unfortunately, that's part of the legacy of the Soviet Union in many, many places. Um, and unfortunately, before the Soviet Union, it was the Russian legacy of a secret police and a, an authoritarian government led by autocratic rule. And um, while there were reforms made, those were not always successful. And so my research has really been, for the last 16 years, it's kind of my side research. I'm an Americanist by training, but I, um, I stumbled onto this in my Moldovan venture in 2006, that in these post-Soviet republics, especially these five that I look at, which Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, they're, they're perilously perched in some ways. The Soviet Union did a lot of damage to internal cultures in them. And in fact, in some of them, the Georgian culture, which is 10,000 years old in that little plot of land or older, um, they were subdued. They were forced to um, go underground. And so at the end of the Soviet Union, they kind of spring forward but they don't know how to behave in a civil society. They don't know how to produce tolerance. They don't know how to forge a society where people can get along. One of the examples I'll give you, of, uh, two examples I'll give you of this. Um, the national anthem of Moldova, a country that is multilingual, is called Limba Nuastra, our language. Yeah, well, that's one-sided. Uh, 
the flag of Georgia, a country that has an ancient history, is made up of five crosses, four of which look like crusaders' crosses. It's a country that's over 10% Muslim. And so these symbols begin to have a lot of meaning in trying to understand how you forge national unity, how you come to an understanding where you can live with one another and begin to um, forge a strong state. And I would argue that one of the reasons you want to have a strong state is because you have a relatively hostile neighbor. Um, unfortunately, in the last 22 years under Vladimir Putin, who really is a ruthless dictator, came to power um, probably by executing Russia or killing Russians in order to produce an, a um, false flag crisis to allow himself to consolidate power, um, and certainly has used that uh, moniker in the in the future years beyond, after he was became president. Um, that the, there is a hostile power that would like to do anything to disrupt the normal conduct of society, the movement toward democracy, the deepening of the state, the fulfillment of successful states. In all five of my countries, there are territorial disputes. There are ongoing territorial disputes, which I would have told you before 2021, made it impossible for any of the five to join NATO or the European Union. NATO is not going to accept a member into it that has a territorial dispute. Remember, the goal of NATO is that we want to attack on one is an attack on all. We're all going to come to the defense. But Ukraine doesn't have control over its internationally agreed upon territory. Donetsk and Lugansk aren't under the, under the authority of Kyiv. Crimea certainly isn't under the authority of Kyiv. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about, and I was very interested in, what is Ukrainian identity? And is it really as divided between a Russian side and a Ukrainian side? So when I began to talk to some of the scholars in the area and trying to get my hands around Ukraine, I had Moldova and Georgia really well settled and Armenia and Azerbaijan I have a good understanding of. I was like, well, what is it that makes people Ukrainian? Because what I found in Moldova and Georgia is that some of the things that make people Moldovan or, or Georgian are actually quite divisive. The symbols aren't unifying. They're actually divisive. And I said, so what is it that, that forges the schism inside of Ukraine? I said, is it ethnic? I mean, is there an ethnicity that you can determine this person's Ukrainian, this person is more Russian? My, my Ukrainian friend is part of the diaspora. So, oh, no, 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 no. There's lots of intermarriage. This notion that, you know, this person's Ukrainian, this person's Russian, that, that's just not, that's not, that's not apropos. I mean, there's people that immigrated from Russia recently. There's people that immigrated from Russia thousand years ago, there's descendants of peasants who've all been intermarrying for all this period of time. Okay, well, this is kind of confusing to me because I thought this was really very ethnic. I said, well, is it, is it about what language you speak? Is it Russian or Ukrainian? Oh, no, 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 no. In, in Kiev, you'll hear one person speaking Russian and another person speaking Ukrainian and having a conversation with each other because most people in Ukraine speak two languages, Russian and Ukrainian. And, and just to make a point, they are different languages. They're not the same language, which sometimes people make a mistake of understanding. And Ukrainian is not just a dialect of Russian. They are distinct, and there is some significant differences between the two of them. We don't need to go into that, that, that discussion right now. Um, but, but so I was like, well, what is, is it the church? No, 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 no. We've got the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, and the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which operates just like an Orthodox Church, in terms of its services, but is under the, the Pope. I said, well, what is it that makes Ukraine Ukrainian? I mean, what is it that distinguishes these groups of people? And uh, that really becomes the centerpiece of my research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some people that I've talked to and give you some understanding of where they see this and some of what they're doing today. So I didn't get a lot of work done. I was, I was actually on my Fulbright for 18 days um, before we got pulled. Um, and now I'm in Poland and I'm trying to write things and, and pull this together. Um, but one of the things, the interview that I did that was with a civil society activist, as I asked him, I said, so, so do you see yourself as Russian? Do you see yourself as Ukrainian? How do you see yourself? One of the questions I like to ask. He said, well, you know, I grew up in a Russian speaking household and um, I speak both languages, but I, I, I was certainly more Russian than Ukrainian. I was born in Lugansk, one of the separatist provinces where Vladimir Putin claims that Russian 
There is a genocide on Russian speakers. This is why one of his reasons that he had to march into Ukraine is. And he says, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the people that are running this show, this, this, this thing that's going on in Lugansk, I never saw them before um, 2014. They were never there. And he says, I think they're all Russians who've been coming in and stirring up trouble. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm listening to what he has to say. I said, well, how do you see yourself? I mean, he's in Kiev now. Oh, well, I left as soon as the Russians came because I'm Ukrainian. I said, oh, interesting. But you speak Russian. He said, yeah, I speak Russian mostly, but lately I've been feeling more like I needed to speak Ukrainian. You, you feel pressure to speak Ukrainian. No, I feel pressure that I don't want to be associated with Russia. And, and I think this is kind of a telling moment in understanding Ukrainian identity. The galvanizing effect of the separatist provinces, the, the subtraction of Crimea, is that Vladimir Putin subtracted from Ukraine many of the people that would have been his internal allies. And for the folks that were kind of in the middle ground, they've moved. They've become much stronger Ukrainian patriots. And so whether you speak Russian or you speak Ukrainian, or whether you see yourself as a, as a, as a cultural Russian, which by the way, the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, is a Russophone Jewish man who um, is supposedly, according to Vladimir Putin, Nazifying Ukraine and trying to create a genocide against Russian speakers. And, and just the sheer illogical conclusion that you make about that is, is, is fantastical. Um, then I want to tell you another story about, about um, someone. Her name is Irina Tisla-Tsvila. Um, she uh, had served in the Ukrainian military. One of the things I've learned in doing a little bit of research about Irina's story is that one-fifth of the Ukrainian military is women. And so we have this kind of vision that there should be young men going to war. But in many, many cases, it's women and not necessarily young women because Irina was 48 this year. And um, she has children, the mother. Um, when the Russians started the um, separatist movement in Donetsk and Luhansk and the, Domba um, the Donbass, Irina volunteered for the army, joined the army and went and fought. Um, she saw it as her patriotic duty to her country. Um, and um, after having fought there and some of the men saying, you need to go on back home, and she said, I don't need to go home. I need to fight for my country. This is my, this is my calling in life. Um, after having done that, she came back to Kiev, and uh, one of my Fulbright colleagues was doing a photo essay on um, Ukrainian veterans from um, the ongoing conflict in the East. Um, and 14,000 people have died in that over the last um, eight years. 14,000. There's been an ongoing trickle of people dying in Donbass. Uh, but Irina survived. Her husband, Dimitri, also survived. They came back, Eve, they continued their family. And when um, Vladimir Putin began to advance troops to come into Kiev, um, Irina and her husband were activated. And they went to right near the area that I lived in in Kiev. I lived in Obolon, which is the north of the city and is under at least some titular Russian control at this point. It's where the tank drove over the car, if you've seen that video. Um, Irina and her husband decided to take on a Soviet tank with their guns. And they died. They're heroes of their homeland. But they died. And their children don't have parents anymore. And the best logic that I can tell you that their deaths happen is because a tyrannical dictator in 2022 has decided to build an empire back that he believes he's due. And he's creating orphans, and widows, and widowers, and he's going to take on people with guns and Molotov cocktails, with fire shooting cannons and missiles and tanks in the modern world, in our society in the world in which we live. And to me, that is stunning. 
I, I remember when we got evacuated from Kiev and on um, January 27th. Uh, my daughter was with me. That's one of the reasons I came back to the States. I brought my daughter home. I said, no, 12-year-old doing this kind of um, Fulbright in exile, not a good idea, but I think we're going back to Ukraine. So I'll tell you what, Liv, why don't you go home? You can finish out seventh grade at home. You are having problems with the online school anyway, and you can come back in May, but because by May we'll be back in Kyiv. There's no reason to think that we're going to be out of Kyiv forever. There's no way that in 2022, and I'm no fan of Vladimir Putin, and I've always thought that he was a risk calculator, much like Professor Daniel said. He's not going to enrage the entire world around him. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll annex Donetsk and Lugansk to send a signal out to the world that he's, he's potent and that he has problems. No, he invaded Ukraine. And I'm going to offer a little bit more on why this may have happened right now, right here. Um, last summer, I was in Batumi in Georgia. And I was, it was fascinating because there was a Ukrainian flag, a Georgian flag, and a Moldovan flag. They're all flying together. I'm like, those are my, three of my countries. I'm like, oh, wow, my people are here. They're, they're all here. And, um, and then I heard there's a summit of the presidents of the three countries. And I thought, oh, well, nothing. The Georgian president is, is useless. Um, and, um, and, and while I like Zelensky and I think he's really a hero in the moment, he's had a lot of trouble governing. Um, and he hasn't enjoyed widespread support of his people, and he's been seen as a little bit off the wall by European political types. Um, not now, but I'm talking about six months before this moment. And um, the Moldovans had a new president. They just elected this youngish woman, 48 years old, and I was like, oh, well, whatever. They're going to get together, and they're going to issue some kind of proclamation that's going to mean nothing. They did issue a proclamation. It was that Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia were going to advance a joint application for NATO and EU membership. And then I started paying more attention to the new Moldovan president. She's Harvard educated. She speaks fluent English and French. She's a beneficiary of United States programs. She's done lots of civil society programs. She's sharp and she's impressive. And what this was sending is a message to Europe that this was going to become an ongoing pressure by three countries. On their own, none of them looked like they had any chance. Together, that package looks a whole lot different, especially when you have a very capable, young, articulate leader with strong U.S. connections. And so I think this pushed Vladimir Putin. I think he was already plotting at this point, but I think it pushed him even further into a sense that he had to retake the territory that he believes is so important to be a buffer zone to Russia. And, um, and so this is what I think is going on here. The horrific personal side of it is people are dying. People are dying every day. Russian soldiers are dying. And I ought to, you ought to know that Russian soldiers are 20 year old kids that have been conscripted into the army. They're not there because they have ideological passion or a great love for Vladimir Putin. They're there because they have to be there. They're there because they're terrified not to be there. So this whole group of people colliding together with advanced weaponry that is of the most horrific caliber, all being done because Vladimir Putin, and I think Professor Daniel said it very well, I think he envisions himself as some kind of Russian imperial czar that's going to balance the power and, or be the third um, point of power in a world that is changing in a way that he doesn't like. And that is all my time. I had a stopwatch up so that I wouldn't go over and I wanted to abide by Dean Gustafson's rules. It kind of scares me and um, I'll end there. All right. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jim Hunt, and I'm going to try to follow up on some of the themes that Wallace and Chris were talking about, because I think anyone with an interest in Ukraine or or the Ukrainian situation now can, can relate to those themes. Let me say something about my own experience there to kind of personalize this a little bit, and then I'll talk a little bit about the business or, and or economic effects of, of this war 
Um, there's already a ton of discussion about uh, sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to say a little bit about those to the extent that I can. I was in Ukraine uh, in Kyiv from August of 2005, 2006. It was one of the greatest opportunities of my career as any Fulbright would be, as Chris could certainly confirm from his own experiences. Um, and I taught uh, uh, in the law school at Kiev Mohila uh, National University or National University of Co Kiev Mohila Academy. It has an extremely long name. Uh, we lived in Padal. I went with my wife and two children. My son was able to attend the ninth grade in, uh, uh, at an international school. My daughter attended the first grade. So we had a huge family event there, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, my son even picked up a lot of Russian and he enjoyed playing basketball with the Ukrainians because they were so terrible at basketball. Uh, and back here in the United States, he was just an average basketball player, but there he was a star. Um, but on the other hand, when they they, they decided to switch to soccer. He was back at the bottom of the pile. Uh, they were so much better than he was. So we had a real family experience. My wife was involved with the church there, a Baptist church. Uh, she's much better at that sort of thing than I am, uh, whether it's in Macon or Kiev. So we had a very sort of family experience there. I taught uh, in two programs. I taught, like I said, in the law school, and I was fortunate to teach students who were already lawyers. Uh, they were in a graduate program. And I tried to sort of milk out of them their experiences as lawyers because my focus there was the rule of law. And you, you have to kind of keep in mind that this is a country or a tradition without the rule of law. Wallace also mentioned that and Chris. This is a country with a legal system that was based entirely on power. Whatever those in power said was the law. Uh, the judiciary was corrupt. I think the judges when I was there were being paid $200 a month. My own students were being paid $500 a month to work as lawyers. So there wasn't a tradition of the rule of law, unlike fortunately our students at Mercer are entering into from day one. These people were extremely courageous. They were heroes, the kind of heroes that Chris was talking about. Uh, they were trying to build a society built around the rule of law, which means fair laws, predictable laws, uh, judges who were not bought. One of my favorite stories uh, related to the law school was the dean of my law school told me that an associate of his, a professor at another law school in Kiev, had just told him that the dean, his dean, another law school, showed up with all the grades filled in for the students in his class. And why was that? Because the dean had been bribed for a certain amount for an A or a B or a C. This was in 2006, and this was in the law school. So uh, uh, the Ukrainians have been trying to overcome this kind of deep-seated corruption and lack of a civil society that was left to them by really the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I met some wonderful, wonderful young lawyers who were trying to change things uh, in their own way. I also taught in a master's program, uh, which was for economic students. And this is sort of the other angle here. Uh, the economy was a communist economy that their parents grew up in. Everyone was employed by the government. And the, the old joke was, uh, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. It was a lousy economic system that made essentially everybody poor. As Chris can confirm, all the apartments in Kiev that were built before 1990 look exactly the same. So everyone has the same apartment. Uh, this is inefficient. It's ridiculous. It's ugly. And uh, fortunately, I was around these young economic students who wanted to build a market economy, not necessarily an American market economy, but a Western European uh, market economy where people have decent health care, they have decent education, they have jobs where they don't have to work for the government, where they don't face sexual harassment or other types of discrimination. Uh, so again, a very courageous group. It doesn't seem in this country, if you want to be a business lawyer or a business person, that you're some sort of a radical. But 15 years ago in Ukraine, it was seen as a radical because it was a rejection of the kind of legal system and the kind of economic system that I'm afraid to say Vladimir Putin still stands for. Uh, he doesn't stand for the rule of law and he doesn't stand for an open market economy. So for a year, I was fortunate to be surrounded by these young people that I had a great uh, 
um, admiration for, who were trying to overthrow this deeply, deeply corrupt, inefficient, and uh, really poverty-creating kind of a system. So I'm eternally grateful for that. And that was my experience in in Ukraine. Um, one other thing, I did mention the church. The other angle that I saw that was new to me, and in the United States, we uh, I think we take freedom of religion for granted. I don't even know how many churches there are in Macon, but it's dozens and dozens, and everyone gets to choose their own. But the people we met uh, at this, this church in, in Kiev were you know, they were celebrating uh, that they were living in a society where they could choose, you know, their religion. I remember there was a synagogue down the street that was basically barricaded against the anti-Semites. They were coming again out of a tradition that didn't believe in freedom of religion. Uh, So um, anyway, uh, there's a few comments. They're wonderful people uh, struggling, struggling to create a lot of the freedoms and things we take for granted in this country. Uh, Whether we will continue to take them for granted is a major political issue uh, right now. But they didn't take them for granted for very good reasons, uh, which Wallace and Chris have both alluded to historical uh, and present. Um, how about the business end? I was supposed to bring some insight to that. And again, teaching in a in a, in a law department there and uh, the economic department, that was kind of my focus. Um, but just as another side, I got to go to some bar meetings of lawyers, which again, doesn't sound very exciting, but I met some of the first business or corporate lawyers in the country. Again, these are, they, these are ordinary people, but in a way they're heroes. They're trying to avoid the kind of monopoly Um, oligarchical kind of system where the state assets were stolen by people like Putin. Uh, You don't get to be worth $100 billion like Putin unless you steal something, uh, to be honest, at least not in Russia. So um, again, courageous people. Um, I think right now it's very difficult uh, to see what the long-term economic and business uh, consequences are. We really are in new territory. A lot of the pundits I've seen on TV point that out. We don't know exactly what's going to uh, what's going to happen. We've been there before, right? With North Korea, with Syria, with Iran, Iraq, different sanctions, some of which seem to have worked, others have not. Uh, The sanctions uh, now, financial banking, otherwise, are much broader. They're much more intense. Even the Swiss have joined in. The Swiss are (laughs) normally try to stay out of everything except keeping their own money. Um, But uh, here they've joined in uh, with this uh, assault on the oligarchs, especially. Um, uh, And that's going to be very interesting. Uh, Another kind of a bigger picture thing is when you decide to go to war, you're buying it. You're buying the war. Um, And the only question, one that's really not very certain, is how much is it going to cost? Um, I think it's very unfortunate for this topic overall that Putin is willing to pay a lot. Uh, He's willing to pay an enormous amount of money. I I can't even imagine how much it's already cost, billions, just in the last week. Um, Is he willing to accept a trillion dollars, two trillion, three trillion? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think anybody does. His behavior suggests to me, as both Wallace and Chris pointed out, that he's willing to throw the dice all together with this. And that means it's going to be a very expensive war, especially for the Russian and Ukrainian people. And uh, that's a horrific event. Um, It goes beyond the military side, I think. As far as the impact on the U.S., I don't think it'll be um, very much. I mean, we'll see some inflation. We'll see some gas prices uh, go up. We get get about 10 percent of our gas from Russia. But otherwise, we don't buy much from the Russians. I mean, when was the last time you bought a Russian car? Uh, Never. Right. I mean, we don't buy anything from they don't produce anything. This is uh, the Russian economy is basically a failure. It has been for the last 15 years. GDP is flat. Um, wages are very low. There is no middle class in Russia. Uh, there's no middle class that has any political power. It's basically the people who stole state assets like Putin and his oligarch buddies who run the country. So um, I, I don't see, you know, the Russians are less than 1% of our international trade and the Ukrainians even less than that. So I don't see us hurting. It's another one of those situations where we're over here in North America, and that's a great thing in terms of being far from the problems. Uh, um, they don't produce anything we really want. We don't sell them that much uh, compared to China, Mexico, Canada, the EU. Those are our big trading partners. So I think the U.S. will emerge from this. It's just a question of how much, uh, how costly do we want to make this? 
Um, what else? I actually think, and uh, just a couple other comments here. Unfortunately, I think the Chinese are going to be one of the big winners of this. They are going to solidify themselves as number two, at least in terms of of economic powers in the world. They're already there. And I think that this is going to continue uh, because of this war. Putin is shooting himself in the foot economically. That's obvious. It's going to be very expensive. And so, um, you know, the Chinese should be laughing all the way to the bank with this. I hate to say that, but I think it's it's going to happen. They're, they're losing nothing here, basically. Um, and everybody else is going to have to pay some price for it. You know, obviously, and this is really my, my last point, the big uh, the, the cost is going to be the biggest on the Russians, the average Russian and the average Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, depending on how far Putin wants to go, is going to be destroyed. The highways, internet, um, you know, oil stocks, you name it, it's going to be destroyed if Putin pushes it too far. And I think this is going to be one of the horrific aspects of this war. Everything. Um, I saw an interview with a Ukrainian the other day that pointed out that that they have four nuclear power plants in Ukraine. Uh, Putin could easily target target those. This would completely change the whole environmental picture in Europe. Um, and that's just one, the whole power grid itself uh, in Ukraine could easily be destroyed. You don't rebuild those kind of things overnight without a lot of money. I think the West, meaning the U.S. and the EU, is going to have to come up with that money depending on what happens. Um, another big loser here are going to be the average Russians. Uh, we've already seen where the ruble has, within a week, uh, gone from one to 75 per dollar to one to 115 in just seven days. So the average Russian has lost 40% of their assets, and they don't have very many assets to begin with within just a week. So I guess I could leave this with just one sort of broader point, and it's an answer, a question that I don't know the answer to, which is how, how much is Putin willing to pay for this war? How much is he willing to pay? Again, is it $1 trillion, $2 trillion, $3 trillion? He acts like it's, uh, the, the bank vaults are open and he's going to spend whatever it takes to get what he wants. And if that's true, I think the news is really bad, uh, particularly for uh, the Russians and Ukrainians from an economic standpoint. Uh, it's likely that they will not sort of get over this economically in my lifetime or maybe the lifetime of anybody in the room. They'll be paying for this for decades. That, that's how bad it is, uh, I think, uh, from an economic standpoint. Let's hope not. Well, let's hope some rationality prevails. But this could be one of the most expensive wars uh, in the world in many decades, many, many decades. So uh, the news is unknown, but um, I'm afraid a little bit scary. So that's all I had to say. Um, but anyway, thank you for, the, for, for listening. So thank you so much uh, to all three of you for your input. And um, now we would like to have your questions. And to hear what's on your mind, um, we have Matt Smith with a microphone. So um, if we've got some folks over here. If you would, we'll start with Shannon. And please introduce yourself when you ask your question. My name is Shannon Hart. Um, would you like me to stand? Please, that's fine, yes. Um, I've thought a lot about what forms people and conscience and inner life as it affects the way we approach the world. Um, for me, I was formed by my parents, my theology, my life experience, and they're, they're red lines that I won't cross, they're values and standards that I won't betray. Um, perhaps Dr. Daniel can speak to my question. What are the forces that formed Vladimir Putin, and does he have any red lines? Yeah, um, either way, either way, you can, that microphone works. Vladimir Putin was, um, is 69 years old. He was uh, born in Leningrad, called Leningrad in those days, during <clears throat> the end of the Second World War. So he knew, of course, the uh, hunger, the difficulty, uh, the tragedy of one of the major cities in World War II. Um, he 
joined the KGB as a young man and served part of the time in uh, Germany where he witnessed some uprisings that uh, he never forgot. He never forgot, for example, the 1956 uprising in Hungary, which um, scared him, terribly scared him. In fact, the most um, greatest fear that he has is popular uprising. Uh, he's, he's many times dem demonstrated that. His red line in terms of, uh, we came back to, to uh, the, the Soviet Union, and in the 1990s, he served under the head of the state, of the mayor of uh, St. Petersburg. I'll call it St. Petersburg since it's its current name. He served under Anatoly Sobchak, who was a fairly progressive, upstanding, um, Western-oriented person. One would not have suspected, I suppose, many elements of Putin uh, uh, developing as they have developed. He was chosen, personally selected, by Maurice Yeltsin in 1999 to succeed him. He was not, Putin was not known that well. But uh, one of the first things that he did was to attempt to solve the Chechnya uprising when Chechnya tried to break away from, uh, from Russia. Uh, and it was, it was awful. Uh, what he unleashed on that, uh, that province was absolutely awful. Uh, we're calling about uh, bombing and fireballing civilians as well as military. And he quelled it. He quelled Chechnya, but it was, it was absolutely terrible. Looking at him now, um, and coming to the, to the heart of what you just asked, in terms of um, red line and in terms of what he's like now, my interpretation, and others may have a different view, but my interpretation is that in the last couple of years, Vladimir Putin has changed. He's, he's, he is a Soviet person. He thinks like a Soviet person. He was shaped by the old Soviet Union. Uh, he's em embroiled in that Soviet mindset of, of order, uh, of um, force, of uh, not allowing a, a lot of uh, speech to be open and free. He's a Soviet man. Uh, but in, in this way, he's changed, dramatically changed in the last two to three years. We've seen pictures of him sitting at a table at one end of it. And you saw perhaps that recent picture of 10 people at the other end, 20 to 25 feet away. He's afraid of COVID. He's isolated himself. He, is, he was married. He was divorced in 2013. And uh, so there's nobody at home. Uh, he has two children, maybe three. Uh, it's speculated that he had an affair with, uh, with a uh, former uh, gymnast in 2014 following that divorce and that there is a child, although that's not, that's not easily documented. There's a child born in 2015. Does he have a relationship with his grandchildren? His children says they rarely see him. So he's virtually isolated. He's alone on an island. I think in some ways he shows some paranoia. Uh, but in some ways, again, uh, there's one other element that makes this difficult. He's now been in power for 22 years. The only Soviet leader who was in power longer was Joseph Stalin, 1928 to 1953. That's 25 years. So he's coming close to that. When you're in power for that long as a political leader, uh, there are not many examples of ever willing to give that up. Uh, all the other examples are people who died in office, who've been in power that long, 20, 22 years. In 22 years also, you surround yourself, and this is certainly true of him, with voices that tell you what you want to hear 
you don't dare dissent among in that inner security circle. We saw one example of that recently with this uh, Sergei Narishkin, who is the head of um, uh, the deputy head of uh, intelligence, foreign intelligence, when he t he told Putin something like, uh, "If we go into Ukraine, military assault on Ukraine." There will be lots of bodies that will come back home. And Putin quickly shut him down. Uh, and and uh, Narishkin then towed the line that he should have, or thought he should have. So, yeah, that's right. So where does this go? Where is the red line for him? Uh, I don't see it right now, personally. I think it's all or nothing. Uh, and I could be wrong. I could easily be wrong about that. But um, to me, to me, this gamble that he's playing is all of everything. Once he goes in, and they have not begun to use all the, all the military power at their disposal, uh, we're going to see a lot more of that, a lot deeper element than that than we've seen in the last six days. So I think, really, the worst is to come. And the real question is, how are we going to respond to that? I could go on and on, but that's, a, that's enough. This woman right here has hey, a question. Kathy. Kathy yes, ma'am. Just can you can you wait, please, for the microphone so that Sorry. that's okay. I thought I was being Thank loud you. enough. I'm no. Kathy Roach. My question is: Do we know of anyone in Russia, whether it's in the military or maybe the you know secret police or uh, the, of the oligarchs, that perhaps could change Putin's mind? to serve their own self-interest, or are we just thinking, no, that Putin has such complete control over all of the institutions that, that make up that country, whether you consider the oligarchs, you know, they're a small percentage, but control a lot of money. Is there any hope for an overthrow? Is there anybody uh, that Chris wants to speak to that? Well, I think that the, the scariest thing for Vladimir Putin, and I think Professor Daniel said it really well, is that he's afraid of the uprising. And this may be the worst part of this, which is as the body bags come home and they keep coming, he's going to have demoralized military. Remember, it's a conscripted army. They didn't, they're not there defending their own people. And people have relatives in Ukraine. They have family in Ukraine. But I say they're not defending their own people. They're not defending a cause that is their own. Russia's not under attack from Ukraine. No, the, the propaganda he's put out is not being bought, at least by some of the news reports we're seeing. And, and so, and especially younger Russians have shown an incredible distaste for the Putin regime. And one of the things that Professor Daniel said so well is that he's isolated himself into a small cabal of yes people. That's probably the biggest change that I would see. I don't think he's losing it or becoming more paranoid. I think he's always been this. But he has isolated himself from more and more information, and he has become so um, dismissive of anyone that questions him that this makes him unable to actually read his own people. Now, in a country that is pretty structured and authoritarian, can people rise up? I don't know. Um, and that's what I'm hoping for because I think it's the only hope for Russia or Ukraine at this point. I would argue that on the international stage, we have to isolate, 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 isolate Russia for this. And it will cause great hardship for the Russian people. But without this, we are going to unleash on this world a, a new fury that is horrific and frightening to me. And so I, I, I would say you isolate. Why Russia has a UN Security, Pol uh, Security Council veto, I don't know. That's something we need to be asking. We need to start asking our diplomats not to be stale. We need to start asking our politicians not to be stale. We've let our democracy become stale because we wanted to fight about things that aren't important. And in the meanwhile, Vladimir Putin has raised up an army and invaded Ukraine. Thank you. I want to get a student over here. Yes. Hi. Um, Can you introduce are, yourself, please? I'm Abigail Van Pelt. Um, what do you think the chances are of Vladimir Putin attacking 
other former Ukrainian states. Other former Soviet states? Yeah, not Ukrainian, sorry. <laughs> right, that's okay. Um, does anybody want to speak to that? I, I can Chris say that the polls you. are very concerned. The poll and the polls are in NATO and not um, a former Soviet state, and they're very concerned. They are absolutely convinced that the next strike will come to Poland. I'm not convinced, but then I was convinced that he wouldn't invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. It's a very good question, and obviously it relates to the future. Putin is ideologically driven by something called the Russia world. It's not a restoration of the old Soviet empire, but it is an attempt to bring under one umbrella, this is ideology, all the people who are Russian speaking, and this uh, goes beyond the Soviet empire, that was a, a, a created, that, that ideology was created in the 1990s by a political scientist, a, a, a fairly liberal political scientist in, in Russia, is picked up by the church, and he's using that, that ideology as um, the foundation of his views, what he's going to do. I'm going to say something now that I, I'm not sure I should say, uh, and I'm not sure it's totally accurate, but it's being, it's being talked about by a very prominent political figure in this country, in the United States, and somebody I respect, her name is Fiona Hill. Um, she, in a recent statement, says that we are now in World War III. That won't spoil your evening, I don't know what will, but it's not just have begun, it's been underway a long time. And she says that when you look at history, when you look at the past, this is a person who's on the front lines of the, of, uh, the Ukraine and the Soviet and Russia um, in our government. She said that when you look at history, it does not go in a straight line. It goes in zigzags. And when you look at the past, you look at World War II, it really didn't begin as we think it did in this country in 1941 to 1945. World War II, she argues, was a continuation of something that began in 1914, and there was a so-called interregnum but that interregnum was only a breathing space until some of those same issues were picked up again. So what if looking back, by the way, she says that if you look at World War II, if you look at Hitler, nobody wants to talk about Hitler anymore, but if you look at Hitler, um, the assault on the Sudetenland, uh, the Anschluss and the assault on Austria, on France, uh, on the Czech Republic, uh, that all that began before 19, for, 1941, of course, in Europe, and of course the 1939 assault on Poland. Now looking back at the present, from the present, what can we see developing already before the present? Let's take Putin, Azerbaijan, which has resisted a military, uh, resisted a kind of military agreement with, the, with Russia, has recently signed one. Belarus, now in Soviet orbit. Georgia, that Chris was talking about a moment ago so well, Georgia uh, has been marginalized. And now, Ukraine. I'm not sure he wants to keep Ukraine. I'm not sure that he wants to destroy Ukraine. And there are various ways to do that. Not necessarily militarily, but by ways of taking territory and dividing it up. There are Romanians and there are Poles and there are others who live in Ukraine. What if you divided it up like he did, he's tried to do in Syria? Then you've got a different calculus. So. I think this issue is 
critical as a world issue, and I think it's really worth thinking about pondering in terms of what you just asked. Thank you. So, gentleman in the back. Uh, my name is Thomas Knight. Um, this is a question, I guess, mostly for Dr. Grant, but for others as well. Um, you talked about how you focus on the three countries, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, and the joint bid to join the European Union, and how the, the problems with that bid largely come from the territorial disputes, obviously in Moldova with the Transistria, and then uh, Ukraine with uh, Crimea and the Donbass region, and obviously in Georgia with the provinces that were taken after the 2008 invasion of Georgia. Um, However, I also think about the uh, about Cyprus, which obviously has a large territorial dispute, um, but it was allowed to join the European Union in 2004. So my question is, from the European perspective, uh, what has changed since then, and how do you explain the reluctance of the European Union to extend membership to these former Soviet states? A really, really good question, and I'm fortunate that I occasionally teach European politics so I can answer a little bit of that, I hope well. Cyprus is an interesting question. The issue with Cyprus has more to do with the territorial dispute and who the territorial dispute is with and how it fits into European Union politics. The fight there is with Turkey. Turkey desperately wants into the EU. Whether they ever get in or not, I'm not sure but they desperately want into the EU. So they're not necessarily Russia posed on the um, eastern border of these countries and, um, and territorial sovereignty being debated. Um, and, and, and I think it's a very good question. Second thing is that the Greek Cypriots, which is the Cyprus part of Cyprus that is in the European Union, um, that was a major push on the part of Greece. And Greece held out on um, admitting an, into the EU um, the Eastern Bloc countries like Poland, Czech Republic, and et cetera, on the, on the cause that they had to let Cyprus in as well. And so ultimately, they, they compromised in letting Cyprus in and saying, yeah, okay, if, if Greece will go along with essentially what Germany wanted, which was to bring in Poland and Czech Republic and uh, Hungary, then, then we'll, we'll make a deal with you. We'll let you have Cyprus if you'll let us have these. The, the issue with Cyprus is economically it's viable in the EU. It's, it, it, it's not going to bleed out the EU. It's a small country. It doesn't have uh, a, a, a terrible economy. Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe. Moldova is the second poorest country in Europe. Um, Georgia is a bit better off than they are, but not a whole lot better off. And, um, and so these are very, very poor states. The EU looks at them and says, you're going to, be, you're going to drain us out for economic resources. Um, people like where I am in Poland have benefited so much from the economic boost the EU gave them. They don't want to see their money going out to Ukraine and, Pol and, and, and Moldova, although the Poles are a little different right now. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good question, and that's the best example. That's the best um, a uh, way I can explain it to you is there was a deal that Germany made with Greece. In addition to that, Turkey is not Russia. Thank you. Another question. Okay, um, the young person right here. <laughs> and then we'll come over here to Alexi. Uh, I'm Connor Santi, and y'all have talked about how the biggest loser is going to be the average Ukrainian or the average Russian. Does the average Russian, like, support this invasion at all, or is it just Putin kind of flexing his muscles? Good question. I don't know who wants to jump in, but the average. Pardon? You're Russian. Okay. Okay. So excuse me a minute. We have a we have somebody that's responding here from the audience. Please, and please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Diana Gradnia. I'm Russian. I'm teaching in IT301. I hope my students here, if not, well, maybe they're watching us. And I'm teaching them about Russia, and I'm doing it here since 2015, about their culture, politics, and everything. And I would love to deliver some good news, but uh, recent days, I'm, 
on point, and uh, I noticed the tendency, and it's actually what happened to Russian people. When they feel the danger, when they feel that they are at war, and they obviously at war right now, they like to unite under that um, sense of victimization. They feel themselves, propaganda convinced them that they are victims, that Ukraine uh, is ruled by Ukro-fascists, that's how you, uh, Russian propaganda define Ukrainians and the modern Ukrainian government. And uh, uh, recently, just these days, uh, the rating of President Putin rose from 61 to 71 percent. So we see that consolidation of a nation in a negative form. And sanctions actually had a great impact on their minds because they had this experience in the Soviet Union and even prior to live with minimum comfort, if any comfort at all. They know how to survive. They had these wars, repressions, red terror, whatever. Um, and this is something they know. This is something they know. So uh, the only one percentage hasn't changed yet is those who are against the war. It's still 22 pe 22%, 22% of people. What will happen next, I don't know. I really can't, I, I don't know. I cannot prognose anything. I have a hope, I have a, but propaganda all these years worked so hard on their minds. And once again, the old generation, well, that generation, that aging, right? And Mr. Putin is 69 years old, right? They, they are in that um, moment that they want to restore something that they liked in their youth. And that was Soviet Union when they were young. So the question is, what is the people of 50, 40 years old who are in power right now in Russia, how they will act under those sanctions? Because, well, you mentioned here about um, dead bodies that should be delivered to Russia. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Russian government sent mobile crematoriums where they burnt right now those bodies and very little amount of bodies will be sent back. Um, we see the attack not just on Ukraine, we see an attack on Russians. However, Russians maybe don't understand what is going on because they obviously brainwashed heavily. They really believe that they are saving Ukraine from Nazism, new, more, new form of Nazism. But at the same time, we're dealing with certain identity of people that has been formed for centuries. Well, well, I, I would like to bring some joke, but I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for sharing. I think Alexi had a, oh, sorry, wait a second. Chris had a comment first. I was just going to say that I think that what Professor Grotney just said is really important here. The Russian people are also Putin's victims. It is not just outside of Russia. And while he may enjoy very popular support, it is done on the basis of taking a very rich tradition, a rich intellectual culture, and twisting it and limiting information in ways that are really frightening. Russian people, really, right after the end of the Soviet Union, were embracing freedom and democracy in ways that Americans could learn something from. And what's happened over the last 22 years is exactly what Diana said. We have a question here. My name is Alexis Chauchois. I'm French. So most of the news I get from the conflict come from Europe. Um, so if everybody, if everybody is there uh, agrees to condemn uh, Putin's actions, there are also uh, another reading of the conflict 
conflict uh, of a possible uh, involvement or involvement of uh, NATO's. Uh, let me explain. Uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, there was an agreement between President Gorbachev and James Baker about a non-extension of uh, NATO's NATO, a NATO's country towards the, the east. And if during the th uh, 30 years later, you can see this extension. And now if you look at the map of NATO's countries surrounding uh, the, the Russian border. So could you tell me what, what do you think about this uh, wanna, possible uh, yes, please. Uh, option? There, there have been many, many mistakes, and you're quite right. Uh, there was an agreement between <coughs> Gorbachev and, uh, and, and Jim Baker. Uh, it was part of the Bush administration, the H. George H.W. Bush administration. And that was, if you will, unite Germany, we will not extend NATO. Well, 1990, is it 1996 or 97? I think it was 1997, NATO was extended enormously. Um, I think in that year, NATO went to, there were three states that it went to, I think, I, I, I'll make a mistake if I try to call them, but there were three places that it extended to. And that, uh, that is frightening, particularly to, um, that was very frightening to Yeltsin in 1997. He was furious about it, uh, and we've seen it continue to expand since then, all around. I, sh I shouldn't tell a personal example here, but when I was a student in Moscow, I had a roommate, a sweet mate, I was there for a year, uh, who, uh, if he ever went to class, I never saw it. Uh, I do know that he drank a lot, uh, a lot. And uh, one evening, about midnight, he came into my room and he said, let's talk about foreign policy. So he pulled out this sheet of paper and he drew a map of the Soviet Union then. And he said, let's look at where your missiles are located. And he looked, he drew these X marks and it was all around. Then he said, now let's look at your country and where the missiles are, where our missiles are. Eventually, of course, they were in, uh, in Cuba, but that's it. Now, put yourself in that situation in terms of insecurity, particularly when two world wars had been fought on your soil, First World War and the Second World War, which, um, in which 28 million Russians died. Uh, what kinds of psychological feelings about security and insecurity would one have? And you're quite right about that. Okay. We've made a can lot I, of can steps I, and there's more, but that's enough. I, can I just make one comment Sorry. about that? When I was in Ukraine, of course, the major item in the news was the U.S. invasion of Iraq under very questionable circumstances raised by the U.N. In fact, there were estimates at the time that the U.S. military killed 20,000 Iraqi civilians, and that war cost up to $3 trillion or will cost. That's something that Putin, I, I got a sense of, and the Russians uh, are aware of. I took a lot of flack from that. Here I was coming from the U.S., talking about the rule of law, and my own country had invaded Iraq under what turned out to be a false pretense. So I think we, we do need to be careful. I'm kind of following up to Wallace. What, what do we do as the United States? What kind of role model do we set? Um, someone who's sort of a cynic like I think Putin is uh, would see U.S. action and say, well, you do it. Uh, you essentially do the same thing. And I'm not making a direct comparison, but I think there is a comparison. And we need to look to ourselves and not just uh, necessarily to the behavior of other countries. Well, we're at an hour and a half. Is there any other pen, pending question here? Okay, one, one more in the back there, and then I have a student here as well. Then we'll wrap it up. Um, my name is Mohammed, and this might not be the most best articulated question, so I'm sorry for that, but 
for Russian reform, because I'm seeing one of the possible outcomes of this being some type of like government, not our government intervention, but just some idea of like reform within the Russian government after this war or whenever this war ends. Do you think it's possible that, like, do you think Russian reform is possible in a sense? Because I would think of Vladimir Putin more so as a cog in the machine of Russian authoritative government over anything else. So even if he did step down and like his oligarchy, there would just be so much, I guess, remnants. So what would be the first steps toward like this change? Sure. <clears throat> we saw that reform after Stalin, after Stalin died in 1953. The Khrushchev period uh, from 54 after he gained control until the late 1950 was, was a time of, of significant reform. Um, it was not reform of the church, which took, there was a second assault on the church led by Khrushchev, so I'm not praising him totally. But there was, there was a significant time of reform. If Putin were to pass from the scene, uh, I think there you would see, we would see significant changes, significant. Uh, it's been building up for some time. These are educated people by and large. Uh, there's a very strong intelligentsia there. Uh, they've got ideas now about reform. We saw significant reform under Mikhail Gorbachev before the pendulum swung back the other way. So I, I think the potential is great. And I think if, um, if, if we see what we could see, and that is the fall of, of, um, of um, Putin eventually, I think we could have the opportunity to see something very different. That's my hope. There's one um, question over here, and then we will conclude. Hello, my name is Thomas Sangaridis, and I'm a Greek Cypriot. Uh, it was good to see someone shine some light on my country, but my question does not uh, regard that. Um, my question is, what actions can be taken against Russia or against uh, the, the former Soviet states to prevent this conflict from escalating or to limit its violence? Great question. Uh, I see Chris raising his hand. I think isolation is the only thing that can happen in a case like this. Um, I truly worry about what happens if you say to this dictator, this land grab or this country grab, this will be tolerated by the international community. What does this communicate to China about Taiwan? What does this communicate to Turkey about Cyprus? Although it's a different story, but what does it communicate to so many other places where we've had some kind of um, holding of a line, a border has been, and the Ukrainian borders are a whole different topic that could be discussed for a long time, um, but that we've held on to some remnant of civilization and civilized boundaries. So I, I think that the isolation of Russia, that there, it just has to be isolated in this case. And I hope very much with what Professor Daniel said is that that will start poking some of the oligarchs to say, hey, this is not comfortable. But I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic about it. And I think that in some ways it's very hard to imagine what will internally bring Putin down. One of the things that he does about every year is he locks up one of the oligarchs that's been in his... Um, past the supporter so that he can say, oh, look, this is what will happen to you if you go against me. But I, would, I would just say the flip side of what Chris is saying is the unity outside Russia, the unity of the EU, the unity with the United States and the Japanese and every other country that has sympathy with Ukraine, that to isolate uh, the Russians, we have to have unity on the other side of that isolation. That's always difficult to get. So I think we need to bring the evening to a close. Um, thank you so much for the excellent questions. And thank you for our speakers, Jim and Chris and Wallace. And uh, thank you for the tech people in the back that <laughs> made this possible. <laughs>